Hi, everybody. Um, I am very honored to be here. I am actually privileged. Harry asked me, invited me to be here to, um, you know, explain a few things about the insurance industry, how I do my business, how I got started, and, you know, just to give, like, a real-world perspective about what really goes on in the business. Um, I want to get started. I started my business back in 2007. Uh, before that, I was with John Hancock Financial Network. Uh, there, there, I was a captive agent, and I, I got some good training with them, some good real-world experience. But um, as you'll see on the on the bullet point here, you'll see the cons of being um, captive agent. But I mean, for anybody out there who is captive, no offense, um, just wasn't for me. Uh, but before I became a captive agent, I was with Ameriprise Financial. Um, didn't really work for them, just had this, I went through their sponsorship program where I got licensed for Life Health and my Series 7 and my Series 66 license. And then I interviewed with John Hancock, there I landed the position, registered representative. Um, but being captive, uh, I didn't feel like I was getting paid for what I was doing. So I'm just gonna I'm, I'm gonna give a real world perspective, go over these slides with you, and explain why I did what I did and what I do. So why an independent broker and not a captive agent? As you'll see on the list here, the pros of being independent: you have a broad range of products from multiple carriers. Um, some carriers specialize in certain products, but don't allow you to go to other companies if you're a captive agent. Um, also, being independent. I'm able to keep my own book of business. I get to keep my residuals. Those are the residuals are from year two and year two and beyond when the when the policyholders you know pay their annual their annual premium. I get I get a small you know I get a small percentage of that. When you're captive, I from where I was, you lose that if you lose the company even after ten years. But being independent, day one, you're fully vested, and you do get a higher compensation. Higher commission, being independent. Um, depending what company I go with, the lowest lowest I get is 80%. The most I can get is 105% of first year's premium. Um, when I was with John Hancock, I was only receiving 50%, and some policies 40%. Which I mean, good policies just wasn't really my really wasn't making me enough revenue, and I thought I was worth more. And also, being independent, you have no sales quotas to me. I know there's a couple companies out there, if you don't hit a certain certain number, then they keep your policyholders and they send you packing. Um, to me, that's not, I don't know, that's not good business. But it, it is good for your manager. And being a broker, we work for the client, put the client's interest first. Um, captive company, from what I see and from what I dealt with, they put the insurer's interest first. And there's no forced cold calling. Um, I see a question there. I, I'll, I'll get to the questions when, I, when I'm done with this one slide. Um, yeah, no forced cold calling. Uh, I have to, well, as you see, I have to earn my own business. But um, yeah, they don't give you a list of clients to call. I mean, they will give you a list of clients to call. But being independent, you have to find your own find your own clients, and that's where number two is on the bottom. And also, being independent, the con, main con is the cost. Everything is out of pocket for me. And I get no salary, it's all straight commission, so um, I get what I'm worth. If I don't work hard that month, then, then I don't get paid as well. And there's no financing plan like being captured. They'll pay you a small salary for three years, and then after that you are Straight commission. So, Harry, um, next slide, but I'm going to read this quick question. And if anybody wants to chime in, please do so. I'm going to read a question. When the premium is 105, can you explain collateral? Okay, great question. If the client cancels their policy within the first year, you do have to pay back every commission, every every dollar that you received. So that's that's one of the drawbacks of this industry. If after the first year, they cancel the pop, or before the first year is over, you got to pay back the premium. So, somebody else typing? Okay, I'll, I'll wait for that one. 
Okay, when I first get started meeting with a client, I like to find out a few things ahead of time, or initially when I meet with them. Um, most important, I want to see if they have disability insurance, because you can have the best financial plan, the best portfolio, the best investment. If you don't have disability insurance, how are you going to fund that? You know, everything's going to fall apart. Um, also, homeowners insurance, auto insurance, liability insurance. All it takes is one lawsuit. You know, if you're not adequately covered, you are you are toast. <laughs> you can lose you can lose everything. So, making sure your client your client is adequately covered for uh, liability insurance that is that is a must. And you, you'll find that out during the fact finding process. Um, here, and next one, it's a little it's controversial. Everybody thinks health insurance is the most important. It, I mean, it's very important. But there are there are situations where you can make payments, um, you know, good good faith payments. You can go on Medicaid, God forbid. Um, and there's other social services depending on your state. Here in New Jersey, they, you know, um, there's a, a very liberal state, so we take care of everybody if they need help. Um, I mean, that's starting to change now with the, some plans with the governor. I'm sure you'll see in the news, Chris Christie. Um, but health insurance, it, like, like I said, it is very important, but not the most important, like some people think. I'm going to read the next question. And Harry, next slide, please. OK, Ting, yes, much, much harder to find clients when you're independent. Um, when, when, you're, when you're a captured agent, you usually get a list of clients to call, both cold calling and you can inherit a book. It's called They're called orphan clients. An orphan client is a policyholder with the company who their agent retired, you know, were a lot of turnovers with captive companies. So the client or the, the agent got let go, so the client moves on to, an, to the new agent. Um, but yes, uh, being independent, you got to find your own leads. Um, on a couple of slides down, I believe it was. You, you don't have to go there, Harry. A couple of slides down, I put that I do not cold call. That kind of makes it a little harder for me, but it brings me better clients because I'm dealing with people who want something, not just calling them out of the blue trying to sell them something. I don't really consider myself a salesman, I'm more more of an advisor. So. That's how I like to keep my business model. Um, yeah, Norman, I guess I just answered your question. <laughs> um, well, also, I do team up with some financial planners and accountants. They're very, very, I mean, they'll, they'll be your best friend because you'll work shoulder to shoulder with them. Um, I mean, it's their clients, so. Um, all right, let me see what else. Uh, OK, advisory clients. This client sees the value of what you can offer. When I meet with a client first, I like to start with a 10, 15 minute icebreaker. That's where I get to know them and take mental notes about them, what they're passionate about, get to learn about their family, um, you know, what, you know what, what they do for a living, their kind of friends, what they understand about the insurance and what, what I can offer. Uh, let's see. Uh, and I also ask them why they want this policy, how they came to the idea. You know, were they were they talking to an attorney, to a friend? You know, you got to get this. You got to, you know, you got to talk to an agent. So they could call me, and then that's that. That's what I find out with them first. And the fact finder in financial planning, you do the same exact thing. Um, insurance, as an insurance broker, we do full financial full, full fact finding. Um, gather all the assets, all the liabilities. Ask the questions, family history, job, career plans. Do they plan on building their family? Do they plan on changing careers, what they want to do with the future? And most importantly, we get a feel for the comfort of you know what kind of monthly budget they're comfortable with, what we can work for. Um, and my meetings usually are very long. They take about two to three hours. Um, most of my clients, you know, make coffee, um, just have a have a great time. Um, so I, I'd say if you're going to meet, if 
if you're going to get into the insurance business and you want to meet with a client, just definitely put aside two hours because my, my minimal meeting, the initial meeting is two hours. All right, next slide, Harry, and I'm going to read Lorenzo's question, um, or the one right above it. Um, I would, uh, uh, that's a good question. Um, financial planning is different than being an insurance broker, but we have the same same goals. Um, I don't know. Maybe Harry could answer that one. You mean about, uh, is it better for a new financial planner to start in a firm or going independent? Is that yeah. Yes. <laughs> well, let, let me let me say this, yeah, yeah. Uh, when you go with a firm, there is some training. Uh, Brian, you did get training with Hancock, right, on sales and that sort of thing. Yes, I did. Yeah. Okay. And, and with Ameriprise too. And, and, and obviously, as you can hear, Brian is a very independent, uh, self-assured individual. But for many of us, having some of those mentors, some of those training, uh, can help us from getting washed through the cracks or just not getting our footing and thinking that maybe this career isn't for us because we're not pulling in the clients when in fact we just needed some uh, guidance would you agree with that brian oh most definitely most definitely um i was i think that i was a little hesitant going out on my own in the beginning just because i was getting comfortable going out with my with my mentor my trainer uh, I, I guess greed got the best of me because <laughs> I, I really felt like I could earn more doing what I was doing. Um, but I really loved working for the company. I, I really loved my manager. He was he was great. Um, yeah, we, we I got really comfortable going out with him. Then I went out on my own. I just learned to trade what he taught me, did what I did, and became very successful at meeting with the people and. Um, then I just decided to take the plunge and go out on my own. I, yeah, like I said, greed got the best of me because I, I felt like I could get paid more than where I was getting paid. I, I'm getting paid double than when I was with Hancock. I can add one other thing, and especially in, in maybe a advisory or whatever. If we think of the two ends of the spectrum, you know, going it alone or going it with a major firm, there's also companies out there which, which um, end up – for example, Cambridge in the area of advisory, what they're doing is they're bringing in a business plan. They're bringing in a mentor who's making sure you're tracking your marketing. They're bringing in compliance. So you're paying them and you're being part of that network, but it's almost a blend of the two. Do they have that sort of thing, uh, Brian, in, in the insurance area where there is a network that's making sure that you're staying on track? Uh, yes, there, there, there are some hybrid companies um, that, I'm a, that I'm affiliated with, like Ohio National. I mean, they, they do have some quotas, but to, if, if you meet a certain quota with them, then you have access to their, you know, their legal team. You have access to the specialists in their areas. Um, but as of like a national branding um I, w I would say MetLife, um, MetLife and Mass Mutual, Prudential. Those are the ones. I, I, I think that's where the captive captive agents come more in because you are taking advantage of their branding, of their image, their advertising. And it, if you take somebody off the street and said, "All right, who would you rather meet with, Prudential or some guy from the Angelucci Financial Group?" Mostly everybody would choose Prudential because of, you know, national awareness. Everybody knows who Prudential is. Nobody really knows who I am. I mean, is, is, did, I answer, did that answer your question, Harry? Yes, it did. Yes, it did. Oh, okay. Okay. Um, so, yeah, that, those, those are the pros and the cons. Um, I, I should have added that on onto the cons on the initial slide. Uh, yeah, brand awareness. So, uh, Okay, Renee asked. Financial planning, meet our clients one four times a year. Yes, I meet with my clients once every year for a review. Um, do a quick fact finder, see if anything's changed. Um, see if we have to update anything. Uh, if you know they can drop some policies, if they don't need them anymore. 
just make changes here and there, update beneficiaries. And it's just, just like in financial planning, you see if any life events happen. So, and Norman being dependent, do you keep up with changes in the industry? Do you attend continues? Uh, every day I'm reading something new that's happening in the industry. Um, I subscribe to several, several periodicals for the insurance industry. And just like financial planning and FINRA, we have to, it, being in, with insurance, you have to do this, your CE credits as well. So yes. Brian, a couple of the questions, because I know the questions are flying. Lorenzo had asked, um, you know, uh, since you don't do cold calling, how large do you like to keep your client base uh, since you certainly have a more personal touch to to your your approach? How many clients, like, for example, how many clients per year do I want to meet with? I, I have a goal of obtaining 50 new clients a year. Um, some... Kind of being kind of new to it, I'm just hitting just hitting that mark. Um, but I, I I did have some transactional clients, which that's oh, convenient because the the slides right up on the screen. Um, like I subscribed to NetQuote, InsureMe. Those are the websites where it they're, they're real time leads. People are online looking for policies, looking for quotes or, or information. And I belong to a certain territory, so they would, I would receive the lead, I would give them the call, because they, they already know what they want. So just being, tra being transactional, they want the best price. And can you explain the difference between an agent and a broker relationship? Agent, broker relationship, uh, brokers, we represent basically every carrier out there, and we work for the client, not the insurance company. But we get paid by the insurance company. Um, being, being an agent, you work directly for the insurance company, and you get their, you can get their benefits and their lead programs. It's basically compensation level, at, or the compensation model, and what you are allowed to do regarding, you know, their policy, what what you can sell, what you cannot sell. So one is just being an agent, you're working for the insurance company, a broker, you're working for the client. That's, okay. that's, that's the main difference. And one other one, um, and, and then I'll let you go on. Uh, in prepping your clients for that two-hour meeting, do you, do, you, do you give them anything, do you, or do you just go in cold with them? Most, I'd say 90%, I just go in cold with them. Because I, I, like, I like to keep it on a personal level. I mean... I keep it professional and business, but I also like to build rapport and make them feel make them feel at ease. Not like not like they're buying something or have to buy anything. I, I talk to them. I talk to them like a friend, you know. But if well, it, it depends. It, it really depends on the client, the kind of client that I'm seeing. Um, I, sometimes I'll just email them the illustration for them to look over ahead of time. Sure. Okay, and opposite of the advisory client, the, the transactional client, they want the best price. When I when I first started out in the business, that's what I was doing. I was subscribing to NetQuote, InsureMe, Insurance, but they're transactional. So, quick, I, I would do a, I would do a quick fact finder just to make sure that it's suitable for what they want, and just sign on the X. You know what I mean? It's one of these quick and dirty, quick and dirty policies. Most of them, most of them were term policies. Young couple needs protection. Okay, give me the best price, just like car insurance. Good. Oh, good. All right, excellent. Okay, brokering my recommendation, finding the best match for my client. I right, here I like to select the policy contract that is best for my client using number of different factors. Um, Rule number one, I do not work with financially unstable carriers or carriers that push one product. Um, there's, I really don't want to name, yeah, it may not be the best for the client, so, and if they don't have any integrity standards, then I don't, I'm not, I'm not going to give them to my client because it's not in their best interest. 
and I wouldn't want to put them in a situation, you know, what happened in 2008. I, I know AIG, it wasn't the life insurance side, but people, people do have fears about, you know, what's going to happen to the market again. And they do have concerns with the insurance company. So I'm only going to, I only put them in highly rated companies. And my, my broker, brokerage general agent or managing general agent, that's what those acronyms stand for. Um, so they, they do the filtering out for me just to make sure that you know, I, I work with the best clients. Um, or, I'm sorry, best companies. Um, Megan, I would say <clears throat> suitability standard, but I like to consider myself in a fiduciary standard uh, just because since I took the financial planning course, but... Um, Harry, would you say I'm more suitability than fiduciary, even though I work more in a not really legally fiduciary capacity? I think your approach, and, 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 I, and I know you, you really do come from a fiduciary mindset. However, I think that industry, uh, especially a lot of the you know independent brokers, they're held that suitability standard. Wouldn't you agree with that? Oh, sure. Yeah. sure definitely. And, and so uh, that may change, and... and as you get your CFP and, and you know that. However, having said that, that's what that's what I would say. All right, excellent. I agree. I agree. Okay, right below that, matching my clients with the best carrier, or I'm sorry, matching carriers with my clients' special needs. Um, here's where it can get a little touchy, and you have to know. Being independent, you pretty much have to do your homework and know your companies. Uh, working with substandard risks, which I have in the past. That I mean. That's where the real money is. It's a lot of legwork. It's a lot of decline, or especially smokers. Um, but substandard risks, matching special carriers. Um, I have a list of carriers who give certain credits for lifestyle. Um, there are certain carriers out there that specialize in substandard risk for people with diabetes, um, to, if you're smokers, then there's there's a carrier out there that can um, perfectly match for for my clients, and then and then there's like your the, the carriers that have low mortality rates. They're very conservative with their underwriting, so they're not paying out as many claims. Those you get they they, they take mostly the super preferred and regular preferred non tobacco risks, and you usually get the best prices at those at those levels. And then. You have to know which carriers have the best conversion privileges. And like I was telling Harry before about there's certain riders for, for basically every need. So it depends on what your client wants, what your client needs, and then there's, there's a company out there. And every company is different. Harry, next slide. And I will answer Lorenzo's question, what software do you use to derive the best insurance policy? <clears throat> Lorenzo, I, I have a couple general agencies that I work with that offer my the insurance carriers, and I will type in my client's information general agency. They, they spit out all the carriers at the rates. Um, one DGA that I work with, it's Crump, Crump Life Insurance Services. I don't know if anybody's heard of them. And then there is also Brokers Clearinghouse. They are in Iowa. I mean, if, if you have Life Insurance Selling Magazine, then you've probably seen these BGAs. And... Those are the ones that give give me the access to their software. And then you could also use WinFlex. WinFlex is for certain carriers that they, they, um, they you have to subscribe to. And you can run every single policy with that carrier. Um, okay, we're up. Does that answer your question, Lorenzo? Okay, excellent. All right, second meeting. Close recommendations, um, like, I, like I've been saying, always act in an advisory capacity. Never, never be a pushy salesman. If you, if you get involved in this industry, you know, do what's right for your client. Do not come off as a pushy salesman because once they start becoming uncomfortable, they see that you're trying to push something onto them, they're going to claim up, and you're not going to get their business. And over another product, and... Number four, it takes skills to close, but more trust 
and building rapport, building relationship with your client. Um, if you lay down this foundation, build the relationships, they're going to recommend their friends, their colleagues. Yeah, they do a good job, they're going to recommend you. Next slide, Harry. Okay, <laughs> this is a fun one. Show me the money. Um, a lot of clients are concerned about how they're going to be able to afford these policies. So what I what I do and what you guys can do, they don't have no, they have no life insurance. You can take what I recommend is just contributing up to your 401k up to the company match, and then you can. The remainder of the contribution just fund the policy, disability, life insurance, whatever it takes. Um, it is a temporary solution and a sacrifice. Uh, work, you know, work a budget. I, I like to work budgets with my clients. It's it's kind of a teeter with them, and also see what else they can cut back on. If you're a broker, look at their look at their coverages, their statements. You know, maybe they're insured too much in one place and not enough in the other. And one thing I do a lot with my clients, I, for my clients who haven't had claims within five years, and if they're paying the lowest deductible, then I have them increase their deductible maybe up to 1000 or $2,000. And I, I've seen this PNC license. Uh, actually, I got PNC licensed back in December 2010 because I noticed I was turning away so much business. Um, every... Mostly every single client I was meeting with asked me if I, they were asking me if I do homeowners, auto, and I got sick of saying no. Um, now I'm fully licensed. So when I go see a client and they have all their policies with me, they're going to, you have a better chance of them staying with you than, you know, one, their auto policy, homeowners with nationwide, and their life insurance with you, and it just, it's just so much better to be able to offer them everything. Um, so, yes, I think that's the rest of the slide, correct? I got, I, I get porched quite often. It's, it, it puts you in a horrible mood. This is when a client doesn't show up for a meeting. You're standing on the porch, you know, looking silly, just standing there like, uh, okay, where's this client at? Um, so yeah, that, that, that makes you feel, it makes you feel awful. Um, and you do not get paid for your time that you put into your business, into your work. I mean, if they don't buy, if the client doesn't buy. You know, like lawyers, lawyers get paid, my, was it, per every half hour? <laughs> um, I, I remember this one case I did two years ago. I was working with this one client for six months. I spent about 80 hours working with him. We applied, he got declined, and it was, it was a huge case. It was a really big case, and um, he was really, he had too many ailments for an insurance company to even look at, but some, some were willing to give him a shot. So it took six months of going back and forth with the insurance companies, and, but those high net worth clients, that, they're more from my CFP that I work with, and I work with them mostly for estate planning purposes. I did some life insurance trust or just approaching um, 55. I, I work between 25, 30 years old to 55. So, um, And yes, you can easily get discouraged and a full feeling of despair. <laughs> when I first started out, I got porched a lot. A lot of declines with the substandard risk clients. I I wanted to quit so many times, but I worked too hard for where I am. Studied too hard for everything I have, the licenses. So I'm not going to give that up. <laughs> and you're gonna <laughs> you're gonna have these clients who say they can't afford it, but they pull out a brand new iPhone, brand new cell phone, and they have a brand new car in a garage. <laughs> you. you it doesn't matter how much of a salesman you are, you're, you're probably not going to get these people. Um, and the last one, overcoming the stereotype image that we have. Um, there's a lot of movies out there about insurance agents, how sleazy they are, just like car salesmen, used car salesmen. Um, hopefully, hopefully my approach to things, if I can rub off on people, 
it'll change that it'll change that uh, stereotype image that they have. Uh, next slide, Harry. All of them come from referrals now. I get handed a lot of CFP clients of um, a lot of my clients they come from CFP, and I also network with a CPA who likes to take advantage of annuities <coughs> for his clients. Um, but yeah, mostly referrals. I uh, no cold calling. So in closing, um, if you have a stomach to you know whether the ups and downs, it's a great great industry to be in. After ten years of being in the business, you can if you're good at what you do, do well by your clients, then you can basically live off your renewals. I've seen that. I'm trying. I'm working working my butt off to get to get to that stage, but I still have a lot of ways to get a lot of ways to go. So, um, like I've been saying, I don't cold call, so therefore my closing ratio is high because I deal with people who want something. Um, not, I don't just talk talk with people who, or I don't try to persuade people to buy something that you know they really don't need or they never asked for. And last. Do your best for your clients. Do what's right for them, and referrals come pouring. Email me. Um, you know, come my friend on Facebook. Connect with me on LinkedIn. More than happy to talk about anything. Um, get, answer any questions you might have about being an independent broker. Um, if you want to get involved with the insurance industry, you know, if you want some advice, opinions, feel free to give me a call. Shoot me an email. Um, yeah, anything. And a um, couple questions at the bottom here. Um, James, I'm sorry, do you deal with high, uh, so building the book of business? Thank you. James, you're, w w was that the last, what was the last question you had, James? Um, <coughs> oh, okay. You can take that. There was a couple questions I want to move back to very quickly because right. they were flying in and, um, yeah. um, right. Oh, Jeff had asked about how, how much do you spend on marketing for a year or is it to the point now it's all referral? Um, good. Uh, that's a good question. Uh, it's at the point where it's just all referrals. Um, marketing to other professionals, um, attorneys, accountants. But I mean, I've I have my website. I do marketing on Facebook and LinkedIn, but I I don't. Maybe I don't know. <laughs> maybe five, maybe five hundred bucks a quarter. I, it's it's not a lot of money because if if you get out there and you see people and you talk to people, that that that's your marketing, you know, and referrals. And there was a and there was a question about your niche. Do you, do you uh, I know you have a pretty wide range of age groups, but is there any certain niche uh, demographic that that tends to be your clientele? Yes, people just like me. I'm 34 years old. I am me. Yeah, just just starting out in life, starting out with your career, building your family. Because I, I can relate to that. I can't really. I mean, I can offer long-term care insurance, but I can't relate with that senior citizen about you know selling about their needs for long-term care because I don't need that. Um, that's more geared towards. Uh, I'll be stereotypical here. Somebody in their fifties and sixties, those those kind of insurance sales sales professionals, um, they're more geared geared towards selling that kind of product. Um, I sell to who I am comfortable with, and that's people just like me. You know, starting a family, you know, buying a house, um, young. I guess I guess you call it professional. Young young professionals or just people my age range starting a family building, family builders. There you go. <laughs> Does that answer? Yes, that does. And and, and Brian, I'm with you. And it's it's great to see you back in class again. So oh, it's great to be here. I, I, I'm not used to the new format. I was, last I left, I was on Noodle. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> so so thank you so much. And, and um, thanks for having me on. Appreciate it. Okay. So, What I'm going to do is have them uh, contact you if that's okay. And now what I'll do is I'll move into the content. And I wanted to catch up on some of the stuff from last week too. Yeah, so. I, call, I took up so much of your time. I apologize. I, 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 I
Oh, no. It's been a pleasure, as you can see from everyone. Um, um, all, all the, all the